From its striking exterior to its rich history and cultural significance, Palazzo Pitti is the largest and most opulent palace you will find in Florence. Behind it lies the Boboli Gardens, the largest green space in the historical center of Florence and considered to be one of the finest royal gardens in Europe. Spanning 45,000 square meters, it is essentially an open-air museum that is full of sculptures, fountains, and architectural and scenic beauty. Today we will be exploring these two Florentine landmarks as we stroll through the lush Boboli Gardens and wander the halls of the majestic Pitti Palace. For 22 euros you get access to the gardens as well as Palazzo Pitti itself and because it's what is it mid-October there's no lines in the ticket office and there's no lines to enter however this won't be the same in summer so preferably book your stuff online before you come and from November 1st the price drops to 14 euro so from the 1st of November up until about the end of February the prices for most of the museums drop as it is the low season You have a straight view of the Duomo from here. That's incredible. We have made it into the Bobbly Gardens. It's a little bit hazy today, a little bit less blue in the sky than normal but it's very peaceful not too many people walking around today super easy entrance so now we're just going to wonder it's mid-october right now and it's like 80 degrees right now so we've been very blessed with some beautiful october weather it still kind of feels like the summer it's a beautiful day and if you look to my right you'll find some wild mushrooms really don't pick the mushrooms so the thing you have to understand about the bobbly gardens is that it's not famous for its flowers such as other gardens are it's famous for its massive green space that is actually peppered with statues and sculptures and fountains and famous artworks from artists 300 400 500 years ago however when you walk around you'll notice that a lot of the sculptures and such as this fountain the fountain of neptune are a bit dark and like degraded and that's because there hasn't really been a massive renovation project here in the last few hundred years. However, for the next eight years until 2030, there's a massive renovation project going on. They are slowly going to transform this entire garden. They're attempting to bring it back to its former glory day so that we can see it just as it was when it was created 300, 400 years ago. It's known for being essentially the prototype that European royal gardens were based off of, in particular Versailles. From the sculptures and the fountains to the greenery and just the whole design of this garden essentially is the map, is the prototype for everything that came after it. Neither of us have actually been to the gardens nor Palazzo Pitti, but I am always blown away by its sheer size. It's like the biggest Palazzo, the biggest palace you'll find in Florence. And it's pretty crazy that it was actually built because Luca Pitti wanted to rival the Medici. And so he decided to build a palace that was bigger than theirs. However, it soon led him to financial ruin. And just like everything in the earth, it comes back around to bite you. And so the Medici had to purchase the property from him in order to pay off their debts. I love this. There's like this little side path here. Reminds me of the fourth Harry Potter when he's in the maze. It's so cool. I love getting lost in little paths like this. Another major part of the renovation project is to secure the trees because during a really windy day, they actually have to close the gardens off because the trees are at risk of falling. And so in that budget for the next eight years it's to make sure that these trees do not fall over or hurt anybody you'll see that there's rope in that holding a lot of them up we are currently beginning our journey through il viottolone the grand avenue or grand boulevard it's a long stretch that stretches all the way from the center of the gardens up until porta romana one of the ancient gates of the city Cosimo II built it back in the year 1600 and he tripled the size of the gardens in doing so. 
It's this avenue that's covered with foliage and cypress trees that create little tunnels and make it just a beautiful little shaded area in the middle of the garden. Along the walk, you'll also find a whole bunch of statues that are placed along the way. This may have been a slight oversight on our part, but we actually thought the gardens would be flatter. It actually is quite hilly. Like for instance, this road that we're on now, it's quite slanted. So if you did have mobility issues, uh, it might be a little bit tricky. It's kind of gravel roads and lots of twists and turns and hills. So just keep that in mind. Il Viotolone is the newest part of the park. And so for a 422 year old pathway and area around us, it's not doing too bad. However, I thought the gardens had like a few main roads. However, the more you walk, the more you find little tunnels ducking off to the side and little walkways going everywhere. So I think you could spend a whole day in here and get pretty lost. But I can imagine in summer, it'd be nice and breezy sitting in the shade when the city is boiling. However, when the city's cooler like it is today, it's actually quite a nice little quiet, peaceful, relaxing setting. Il Viotolone is also famous for these little tunnels that run along the side of it, provide shade for all of those who walk under. And now for the scavenger hunt portion of the tour, we've come across a giant egg. What could it mean? Now that we've walked around a little bit more, I can understand why they have this huge renovation project underway. It's not that things are like damaged or anything, it's that the sculptures look eroded, like they're all dark and have just signs of the times on there. And also like the trees and that, that it's just not entirely maintained. It's still stunning, but you can tell that this place is just too big to actually take care of without the proper funding or resources. And so that kind of makes sense. It'll be interesting to come back and see it in eight years time. Pretty hard to research this place. Got a lot of different little nooks and crannies. I think this is a lemon house. The Medici did have a passion for cultivating and crossbreeding different citrus fruits. And so a lemon house was built in 1778 in the Bobbly Gardens. And on that note, have you guys tried out Michelle's lemon and broccoli pasta recipe? We'll leave a link to it. There's no link for it, but special recipe. One day, if you're lucky, she'll make it for you. Look at the size of this beast. Hey, <laughs> I've never seen, I'm guessing it's a lemon, that big. Hey, you get some pomegranate. Italian word of the day. Melograno, pomegranate. Melograni, more than one pomegranate. The grotto. The grotto of Adam and Eve. Built in 1817, this is the newest grotto of the gardens. Of guess there's a flower garden over here. What's a garden without flowers? Being the largest green space in the historical center of Florence, the gardens tell a story of the three dynasties that created and embellished it over time. The Medici, Lorraine, and Savoy families. 
The creation and development of the Bobberley Gardens spans 400 years from the 15th to 19th century. Once a large area of fields and meadows, the land was purchased by Luca Pitti in 1418 and he soon started to build on it. The property was purchased by Cosimo I's wife, Eleonora, in 1549. She continued to develop and expand on it. The Medici and Lorraine families continued to enrich and enlarge the garden in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, generating an outdoor museum that exhibits both Roman and Renaissance statues. The renovations have begun. Here's his lawn <laughs> At the end of the avenue, you will find the Fountain of the Ocean. Again, it's got a beautiful write-up on the internet and in books and in the fact-checking sites. However, it's not looking too fountainy. There's no water flowing out of it. It's supposed to be Perseus. Perseus? Perseus. Perseus on a... Is per Perseus wasn't the horse, eh? Hey? Pegasus was the horse. Oh, yeah. Well, that was Hercules' horse. <laughs> Sorry, we apologize for our... What is that? Greek? Disney reference? <laughs> <laughs> but there's supposed to be Perseus on a horse and there's supposed to be water flowing out of this Isoloto is what it's called, like the island in the middle and the water flowing out of it is supposed to represent three rivers of the world the Nile, the Euphrates and the Ganges however, yeah, it's not looking too operational again, we'll come back in eight years I love that there's literally statues of dogs everywhere Probably the best statue in the whole place. All the way at the end of the avenue and at the end of the garden, you will find Porta Romana. It's one of the entrances slash exits and it's the ancient gate of Florence. So on the other side of the city, other side of the river, you're probably not likely to walk past it. Blind baseball? I feel like this is old timey baseball. He just got to home plate. We've come across a wild animal. He actually owns the whole garden and the palace. I'm not too sure when mosquito season's over. I thought it would be over by now because it is mid-October, but wow, we are getting bit. I think I got 10 bites on my leg so far. I mean, there's literally mosquitoes everywhere. Uh, I thought we were in the clear since it was fall, but I guess not. We may have slightly misjudged the size of the gardens, but we've been here for two and a half hours and time's running out. We still got to go and explore PT Palace. But now we're going to make Misha run. It's actually very humid. It's, it's very, very hot today. It's 80 <laughs> degrees right now. And the humidity in the gardens are just wild. Absolutely wild. But thankfully the trees overgrown overhead are providing a decent amount of shade in certain areas. So nature's umbrella, if you will. So we've made it to the fountain of the tiny birds. I'm not going to lie, it looks a little sad. The fountain is on and there's literally just a single, a single drizzle down to the bottom. There's only one thing missing from the fountain of the tiny birds. It's the tiny birds. I don't know whether they're supposed to be sculptures or whether tiny birds are supposed to come, but they're no tiny birds. I feel like a lot of the things named here were just picked at random. Maybe back in the day, tiny birds used to come to this fountain. Yeah, yeah. Maybe present day baby birds don't like it. Hmm. I'm really digging these signs because it'll tell you if it's slightly uphill or if it's flat and how long it would take to reach the destination and like what's there. So that's actually super handy. Let's see what's up Chestnut Meadow. You can take the boy out of Africa, but you can't take Africa out of the boy. Mateo's observation now was that it's like being on a game drive and not seeing any animals. Safari. <laughs> it's just a safari minus these animals. Oh, 
I don't think we left enough time to explore the whole garden. <laughs> Whoa. I'm pretty sure this building behind me is meant to be the porcelain museum. But by the sounds of it, there's about six museums in the Palazzo Pitti Bobbly Garden area. A lot of them seem closed for renovations, such as the porcelain museum. It's got porcelain from the last 300 years. We won't know today. We'll see it in eight years. This view is nuts. You'll notice a whole bunch of greenery around the area of Florence, like city center. And that's because this whole side of the river actually used to be like the rolling hills and it slowly got built up over time. However, you can still find the big green open areas around here. I don't think they're just free to access though. I think they belong to some of the villas that are here and the museums and the gardens. But it's pretty cool to see it contrasting with the main city. And on that portion of our game drive, we have found some animals. The fountain of the monkey. <laughs> New theme of this video. This is going to be a comparison video to eight years time from now. So Mateo, come back and see what it looks like. Let's go. And behind us, you have the Statue of Abundance. However, the only thing abundant right now is Michelle's hunger. <laughs> we forgot to bring snacks. Behind me, you will find the Fountain of Neptune. However, the common theme with this garden right now, the fountain is not shooting any water. However, the water in the pond is the water used to provide water to the entire garden. That's a cool fact. Even if the fountain's not very fountainy right now. This big green building is called the Café House. Looks like it's a German word. And from the top you apparently get a stunning view of the city of Florence. However, like the theme of our day, it seems to be closed for internal restoration. From my understanding it just got restored so little bit confused on that one however from the lawn in the front you still get a beautiful view of the city Aww. This little dome behind me is an ice house or an ancient refrigerator. Back in the day before fridges were invented, they used to store drinks and food inside these little domes that are actually dug into the ground a bit. And in order to keep them cool, they used to gather snow from the mountains in Pistoia, which is one of the provinces of Tuscany. And so during events, this would stop the food and drink from spoiling. It's like a hobbit's hut. Right behind Palazzo Pitti and the first thing you find in the Bobbly Gardens is this massive amphitheater. The coolest part about this amphitheater is it exists because the stones used to build Palazzo Pitti were excavated from here and they just happened to figure out that it had the perfect shape to build an amphitheater. The Egyptian obelisk standing in the middle is reported to be one of the oldest monuments in Tuscany. It is 3,500 years old. They date it back to the 15th century BC, crafted in Egypt and brought up here during the 1700s through the Medici family. The basin it sits behind is also a rarity. It comes from the Baths of Nero in Rome and is among the largest intact tanks from antiquity still in existence. So some final thoughts on the gardens of Boboli. What would you say? They are beautiful, but I would only recommend coming here if you really have a lot of time in Florence. Um, it is a nice few hours activities, but it does eat up a good chunk of the day. So 
If you have limited time, I don't know that I would add this to the top of the list, but it is beautiful nonetheless if you did have some time to spare and you wanted to see something beautiful. If you love gardens, come and see it. If you don't like walking, don't come and see it. If you don't like walking or gardens, probably don't come and see it either. <laughs> but I mean, if you only have limited days in Florence, like two or three, I'd probably say skip it. Wouldn't yeah. you think? I like put your time doing other things because this did take quite a long time to walk around. We've been here three or four hours. We didn't even see the whole garden. Yeah, but because things were closed for restoration, like we didn't even get a chance to go yeah. to the porcelain museum and things like that. And obviously, if you're here and they're open, that would take extra time. So the theme of the day is that a lot of the stuff was closed. But yay for restoration. Yay for restoration. We'll come back in eight years. Let us know in the comments below if you want us to return in eight years and see what changes have taken place. We are officially approaching my favorite part as of right now of the garden. Made everything totally worth it. Just like my bronze boar in the city, this is my monument of the gardens. It's a little bit run down, sadly. But cool nonetheless. Built in 1560, La Fontana del Bacchino is of Nano Morgante, one of the court dwarfs of the Medici. He's pictured here riding a tortoise. The tortoise, as well as Capricorn, the astrological sign, are two symbols of the Medici. So every time we see a tortoise or the Capricorn, I don't actually know what the Capricorn looks like, but those are the symbols of the Medici. That's why there's little tortoises scattered throughout the gardens. I'm not gonna lie, the tortoise straight up looks like it is not having a good time. This may be Grotto Grande, but looks under construction, like the rest of the stuff. Now that we're done strolling the gardens for the last four hours, we're gonna enter Palazzo Pitti, the massive palace. And from what I'm beginning to read and see, I think a lot of the rooms are closed as well. For restoration. <laughs> it's like, it's quite, quite confusing though, because the price is not reduced for a ticket. But if they reduce the price of the ticket, they can't pay for the restorations. But you're paying for a ticket to not see all the stuff that's open. We are literally being chased by mosquitoes right now. I see like three of them following your head. Yeah, those are free. pants or something because I, we probably each have about 10 bites already. They're literally flanking you. Oh, ooh. I saved you. Thank you. Thank you. But anyway, let's go. But yes, now we're going to PT Palace. PT Palace. I like palaces. Now that we're standing in the courtyard of Palazzo Pitti, it's a lot bigger inside than it looks from the outside. And outside looks pretty big. This is massive. There's a lot of stones used here to build this. Where is he? Okay, so with all of our activity today, it's now like 4.15 and um, feeling a little hungry, but luckily there is a bar slash cafeteria here in the Palazzo. Mission accomplished. Got a giant sandwich, very fluffy bread. This should hold us over. Now let's go see the palace. Palazzo Pitti is spread across three floors and has five museums. The construction of Palazzo Pitti began in the mid 1400s by the Florentine banker Luca Pitti. Situated along one of the main roads leading into Florence, where the Ponte Vecchio crosses the Arno River. Its creation and development spanned 400 years. Palazzo Pitti was later purchased by the Medici family and was greatly enlarged and updated to become the new and official residence of the Medici. The Medici constructed the Boboli Gardens. Under Cosimo II, the layout of the piazza and the opening up of the view began. The facade then took on its present appearance, except for the two projecting wings, added by the House of Lorraine in the early 18th century. It also housed two other dynasties, the House of Habsburg-Lorraine, who replaced the Medici from 1737, and the Kings of Italy from the House of Savoy. The palace even served as the royal residence of King Vittorio Emanuele II from 1865 to 1871. 
It was eventually turned into a museum complex in the late 19th century, and today, Palazzo Pitti is a testament to the opulence and grandeur of the Renaissance era, with its sprawling gardens, ornate architecture, and vast collections of art and artifacts. Occupying the whole left wing on the first floor, you will find the Palatine Gallery. This gallery contains a broad collection of 16th and 17th century paintings by Italian and European masters of the Renaissance and Baroque periods. It was once the residence of the Medici Grand Dukes, and the Habsburg Lorraine family hung around 500 masterpieces in the ceremonial rooms chosen from the main Medici collections. The paintings in their lavish frames entirely cover the walls of the rooms, which are enriched by sculptures, vases, and tables with semi-precious stones, typical of 17th century galleries. This place is insane. <laughs> uh, we've done like one sixth of it and it's, it's blown me away. I'm like actually, I didn't know what to expect, but this is like crazy. I can't even really explain it. The rooms are just so packed with different things. This has to be visited. You can't actually see this on a camera. <laughs> On the top floor you will find the Gallery of Modern Art, a collection of paintings and sculptures ranging from the end of the 18th century until the first decades of the 20th century. These elegant rooms were inhabited by the Lorraine Grand Dukes and are decorated with works of the neoclassical and romantic periods. The collection is still growing as new pieces are added through donations and purchases. Once the large central hall of a summer apartment for the Medici, 
became the Palatine Chapel. The walls are covered in paintings featuring biblical and evangelical subjects. The altar includes elements from the altar of the Chapel of the Princes in the San Lorenzo Church. The collection of Russian icons is the most ancient selection of the genre outside ancient Ruthenia, loosely corresponding to Ukraine, Belarus and Western Russia today. With the exception of a few pieces that had belonged to the Medici and dated back to the 16th and 17th centuries, the icons entered the collection of the Grand Dukes of Tuscany under the Habsburg-Lorraine dynasty before 1761. On the ground floor, you can find the treasury of the Grand Dukes, the Silver Museum. This museum holds a vast collection of Medici household treasures, from table silverware to precious stone vases, rock crystals and precious jewellery. It is currently 6.30, the museum has just closed. We're some of the last people in there because we're trying to get around to all the rooms. But there are, actually most of the museums are open minus the one about the costume gallery. But what we do have to say. Oof. I don't have words. I mean, I love old stuff like that. Like it's just mind blowing. The gardens were pretty, but slightly underwhelming. And then we walked into the palace and it, like, I just, I, I just, yeah, uh, exactly. Like, I can't, I don't have words. After the garden, we didn't actually expect much. But then when we entered the first room of the palace, we we're like, blown away. I they have, like, they have to restore the garden. So I don't know how much I was expecting from the palace due to like, you know, I was like, okay, they probably have to restore stuff in there too. But like it is in almost like pristine yeah. condition. Wow, it, you can't miss this place. Like maybe the gardens, you can you have the option of buying a double ticket with the garden and the palace, or just a single ticket for the garden or the palace. If you're limited on time, skip the garden. Do not skip Palazzo Pitti. Like yeah. this is, it's a must do on my list now. Like for sure. So recommendations for the day, if you have little time to spare. Definitely skip the gardens, do Palazzo Pitti. If you love gardens, then probably go see the gardens. Or wait eight years. Come back in eight years. But, but definitely, I mean, if you want to, if you do the two together and you're kind of going at a leisurely pace, you probably need about five hours, I mm -hmm. would say, uh, to do both the garden and the palace. And that's palace. at a run. And that's like, yeah, I mean, that's pretty brisk. That's assuming you do yeah. just over two hours in each. I'd month. give the palace maybe a good three hours. If you go slow, I mean, there's a lot to see and there's actually so much to see in there that it's actually overwhelming, like artwork, sculptures, silverware. What is that the museum we went into? There was... The costume one wasn't even open. Okay, yeah. so the, so it took us a few hours today and that's with things being closed for restoration. The costume museum wasn't open, which apparently is absolutely phenomenal. So had those things been open and we had done them, it would have taken even more time. Mm -hmm. So I would think that the gardens and the palace are essentially a whole day activity just on their own when things are running normally. 